Hello and welcome to the Curiosity and Consciousness podcast with me, Karen Maloney. I am your host and the intention of this podcast is to help us open our minds, get curious about ourselves and to raise our vibration and consciousness levels. Through these conversations, we hope that you will go on an inward journey to discover the truth of who you are and to become aware of your own energy and vibration. We have the power to consciously consciously create our lives but we need to wake up to this fact before we can begin the process and learn the key of self-responsibility. Check out the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast, Castbox or whatever platform you listen on and please like, subscribe and share the podcast, leave a review, leave a rating as this will help it to reach more people. Check out my website as well www.soul powerlight.com Hello, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining me for another episode. It is me, Karen Maloney, and thanks as always for tuning in and for coming back and for sharing and helping spread the word of this podcast and the conversations. And today, this week, I have another brilliant conversation for you. And my guest this week is Brianne Davis, and she is an actor, director, producer, and writer. And she's one of the most electric talents to storm Hollywood by force. She recently wrapped two seasons as series regular in History Channel 6, as well as a role in the upcoming season of Netflix Lucifer. Originally from Atlanta, Brianne moved to Los Angeles to pursue her acting career. Her first lead role came in 2005 with the blockbuster hit Jarhead opposite Jake Gyllenhaal. Her credits also include reoccurring roles on Casual, Murder in the First, True Blood, Nip Tuck, NCIS Los Angeles, CSI Miami, Desperate Housewives and True Blood. Not only an actor, Brianne is also an accomplished director and producer Thriving behind the camera as much as in front, she has produced three films with her production company, Give and Take Productions. She has directed two features, The Night Visitor 2, Heather's Story and Deadly Sin, which premiered at the Sidges Film Festival in Spain. Brianne is over a decade of recovery as a sex and love addict and she currently hosts and produces the popular mental health podcast, Secret Life. She recently finished her first Romanoclef fiction novel, Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict, which was released in February of this year. And this conversation with Brianne really centers around her new book, which started out as a memoir, but then developed more into a self-help chiclet, as she calls it. But it really was taking bits of her journey as a sex and love addict, mixing in other people's stories as well and her imagination that created this best-selling book and as she mentions it was never her intention to write a book or to share her story ever but once she hit a decade of recovery she felt she had to share and be of service in a bigger way and this is a really brilliant conversation with Brianne where she does share different bits from her background she explains the difference or simplifies the difference between sex addiction and love addiction she talks about how at age 12 she felt that first sense of a real high and that was a feeling that she searched for ever more since then in her life through different partners and she also shared how the movie Romeo and Juliet gave her a very different sense of what love should be like but a really interesting and fascinating conversation and Brianne mentions as well how how she used to get such a, a thrill from having power and control over another and then once she got that she would be bored but also spoke about you know putting on different masks in order to be the perfect person for someone and she had a story that she wasn't meeting the right guys and it wasn't until she hit her bottom that she talks a little bit about as well that she really saw a shift in her perspective and realized well hey she was the common denominator in her life as well so maybe it wasn't just that she couldn't meet the right guy but actually there was something within her so she shares about her journey the 12-step program how it helped her and also how 
Hollywood really amplified her addiction and disease as well. As she said, showmances were rampant. So a really brilliant conversation, really empowering as well. And especially when she comes to share about accountability and self-love towards the end of the conversation and really how important they are for all of us. So absolutely brilliant conversation. And there is a part in the conversation where Brianne mentions 40 questions from Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And I will share a link to that as well in the show notes for anyone who wants to check. And all Brianne's links, as usual, are on the show notes. Her website is briannedavis.com and for her new book is secretlifenovel.com. But again, I will have everything linked on the show notes. So a really brilliant conversation, not one that you probably get to hear every day. So check it out. Let me know what you think. And for anyone who is struggling, as Brianne mentioned as well, towards the end of the conversation, feel free to reach out to her, send her a message, a DM on Instagram, and she will point you in the right direction. Enjoy. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for tuning in for another week. As always, I have another fantastic guest for you, and I'm super excited today to welcome Brianne Davis. So first of all, Brianne, you're very welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, I think this is going to be a super insightful and maybe not the most common of conversations that we often hear, you know, around coffee table talk, which is super because, again, it's a really important topic. And I think something that I'm really looking forward to delving into today as well and bringing this conversation. And I suppose you're a woman of many talents, as we heard there in your bio, but you recently as well published a book, The Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. So congratulations, first of all, as well on the book. Thank May- you. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, it's it's fictionalized, but it is also based off of some of your your own story and journey as a sex and love addict so maybe if you want to give us a little bit of your background yeah yeah so the book was a memoir when I first wrote it um I wrote it last year as a memoir. I never wanted to write a book, just so everybody knows. I was never going to come out as a sex and love addict. But when Mm -hmm. I hit a decade of recovery in the program, I had this thing where it was like, I actually need to help more people. I started Mm -hmm. sponsoring people all over the world. I started speaking at big meetings and stuff like that. And I just had this overwhelming feeling I had to go bigger. And I wrote this article for HuffPost And in the first month, it was like 2 million hits. And I got all these people reaching out to me. And my husband was like, you need to maybe take this writing class. And I was like, I'm not interested in being a writer. Leave me alone. I'm an actress. Like, give me the give me the lines and I'll say them. Like, I don't want to create the lines. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. So I it was a memoir when it came out. I wrote it in 45 days, the first draft. (laughs) And then when I started writing more and more, it became this other thing. It turned into someone. It turned into my story, but then other people's stories and my imagination Mm -hmm. and what I've heard over the years and it just became its own thing so it's really like a self-help chiclet memoir hybrid is what I call it it's mm-hmm. a Roma class fiction but I dive back into my past I look at the how what when where and why of it all why I became an addict family dynamic the trauma that happened my character defects that ran my life because mm-hmm. when I looked back and I And believe me, chapter five, six, and seven are the worst for me. Like every time I rewrote those chapters, I wanted to throw the book against the wall and be like, I'm done. Oh yeah, it was brutal. Yeah, and looking at the family dynamic was really hard. And I'm I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I've, you know, been an actress for twenty years. I've, you know, had this family dynamic that was, you know, not the most stable. Lots of addicts have that. And so just looking back and I was a, I started to be a sex and love addict at the age, you know, I started masturbating at the age of like four, you you know, the first time I cheated on a partner was in eighth grade. That was like my, the height of my, you know, where I was like, Ooh, I want to do this the rest of my life. So 
Yeah, Mm -hmm. when I look back at my past, it's very dark. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, just to say congratulate you on a decade of recovery and that that idea or that spark or that willingness or eagerness or not not eager, but that that ambition to be able to help many others as well. That's that's huge. And, you know, you've you've mentioned there and I think it'd be really interesting to take the conversation to some of what you mentioned the how what when where and why why you know yeah yeah, you you were led on this path of sex and love addiction but maybe even for some people maybe even just breaking down the terms or what exactly is sex and love addiction yeah I would love to do that so this is how I, I I simplify sex and love addiction so the sex addiction side is you know you're addicted to the act, the sexual mm. act, not the person. So masturbation, porn, m- you know, multiple partners, one night stands, those kind of things, you know, going to massage parlors, those kind of things are you're addicted to the act, not mm. the person. And love addiction is really based in fantasy and romance and being addicted to one person or For me, it was really about being in love with falling in love. Mm. So I would start dating somebody and get, you know, that that rush of emotion. And it's so intense and those butterflies. And I was so addicted to that moment. And, you know, the first kiss, the first time you touch, the first, all those firsts. Yeah. And then when that high would begin to wear off, I then would think in my head, oh, wait, this is not real love. Mm -hmm. Like that butterfly, that passion, that intensity has to be all the time. And love addicts are really addicted to that. And they're addicted to like, you know, the white knight, someone coming to save you, trying to get an unavailable person to like love you, being stuck in a relationship that's toxic, Mm -hmm. all those things. So I'm really a combination of both of them. But here's the thing, if you're listening out there, like I've never had a one night stand. I have not had many sexual partners. So you can be a sex and love addict and not be like going around fucking every single Mm -hmm. thing. Like that's the misconception that people are all, we're all just like, you know, can't like get our hormones together. And that's not true. Yeah, really interesting. And thank you for just giving that, I suppose, explanation as well to help people because yeah, people would have an idea, but then if it's not something they've come across or often as well, I imagine it's it's very much something, and this is a total generalization, something that we would associate more with men than women. Oh yeah. Oh but, yeah. <laughs> but how prevalent is it as well of an issue for women? Well, here's the thing. I mean, I acted more like a male, like mm. I cheated. I was a big cheater. I I had multiple partners at the same time that overlap. Like I would be dumb with a relationship and, but I wouldn't get out of it. I'd be intriguing or looking for somebody else to flirt with or doing all those things. So a lot of the men in the program do that. So when I came into the program, it was, you know, I would probably be like 30% women, 70% Mm -hmm. men, all ages, all ethnicities, all all like if you walk on the street in New York, you would see every walk of life in the mm. meeting, just like on the street in, in, in New York, you would see an A-list celebrity to like a social worker. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was majority men and older people. And now it's 50, 50. I mean, mm. there's more young women coming out and saying they are sex and love addicts than ever before. And I think that's why I spoke, I've been speaking out because I've been really seen with this younger generation being mm. 11 years sober in the program being in I'm an old timer, like it's hard to get time in the program, especially for women. It's really hard for a woman to say she's a sex addict or a sex mm. and love addict. It's it's almost looked like as something, ooh, that's hot. And it's like, I have to tell people, well, it's really? not hot. Oh, <sighs> yeah, it's not. But you have to say, it's not hot to use somebody to make mm. yourself feel better. Like, there's yeah. nothing sexy about that. But I would say now it's very 50-50. A lot of men identify as love addicts. And a lot of women are just identifying as sex addicts. And that did not happen over a decade ago. Yeah. Wow. Um, Really interesting. And, you know, now being 
so far into your recovery in the program and looking back and having the higher perspective you know across your life and kind of what you've gone through and lessons in that can you or do you know really what kicked it off for you what started it oh yeah so I do talk about these in the book but I would love to share them now because yeah that a big moment for me, and I always say this as a as a young girl, I saw movies and TV mm-hmm. and and films way, way too early. Mm-hmm. So one of the movies that I remember that made a big influence on me is Romeo and Juliet. Oh. <laughs> um, so I watched, you know, the 1969 version and Michael White, the lead actor, I remember the moment he got out of the bed when him and Romeo and Juliet were just together and his butt, his naked butt. And I remember thinking in my little brain, like, ooh, that's a cute butt. Yeah. yeah. And then and then I remember I, I seeing the end of the movie and it just like this thought of This is what real love looks like. Mm. One or two people have to be willing to die for each other. Like somebody's got to drink some poison. Somebody's got to try to stab themselves. Like if they're not willing to do that for me, then that's not real love. So that was a big eye-opening moment when I looked back Mm. um, on how, what, when, where, and why. And then the other one is I, during my therapy, I did major therapy for eight years during the first eight years of my recovery. I went twice a week. I was going to four meetings a week in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And mm-hmm. if you are listening out here, I, I'm not saying every 12-step program or 12-step program can fix you. It just really helped me, you know, mm-hmm. get to the other side of this disease. But I blacked out some trauma. I mm-hmm didn't remember I got molested at a very young age by a neighbor. So that Mm. memory came out. And then in eighth grade, the one I just mentioned earlier is I had, you know, your little boyfriend in eighth grade or, you know, your first like, oh, I love this person when you don't know what love is. And his friend, we were at a party and I walked into the closet to get my jacket and his friend came up behind me and shut the door and I remember turning around and his I always knew he kind of had a crush on me and he walked up to me and kissed me in the closet it was like everything connected the high I got from that like little cheating moment Mm. behind my boyfriend's back it was like I attached sexuality you know to like secrets and Mm. dirtiness and 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 like that kind of thing. So those were the moments I found. And I had other moments too, but they're in the book. But those were key, key moments in my life where I was like, oh, I want to be an addict. Like I'm chasing that high, that first kiss high for the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask. What what was the, the sensation that you were, were chasing or seeking oh. through all this and that first kiss high? Wow. What well, age they, What age is eighth grade? I'm not familiar. Um, we do it different in Ireland. Twelve. Around 12. I wow. Yeah. Yeah. So 12 years old. And it was like my entire body was on fire. Mm. I remember it, I could describe it. I've never done heroin or drugs. I'm, I'm not a, a drug person or a drinker, mm-hmm. but it was like, I imagine like a shot of heroin shooting up your arm. That was your drug of choice like that. Everything and anything can be like a, a drug of choice and everyone oh, yeah. chooses their one. So that that was the one that connected for you. And that's, um, you know, really interesting as well, how you mentioned, you know, you managed to block out and blacked out that that trauma from a young age as well of being molested by a neighbor and you know it just goes to show how well for me anyway in a lot of the conversations that we have you know the incredible capacity of our body as well at times to be able to block out things like that that would be too much for us maybe to handle at a time but then usually they may start coming up when it's time for us to heal or look into these deeper emotions and then that's often when we keep running and search more and distract Mm -hmm. and numb and avoid because we're not taught how to process and to feel emotions and like that I can imagine but there's there's a level of having to you know honesty within ourselves as well in speaking it and how was the the cycle for you like you know you mentioned 
that's that's what you were seeking then the whole mm-hmm. time so mm-hmm. was it really from that age of 12 then up until 10 years ago when you started your recovery that it, you just felt like this constant chasing or what was the the space within yourself mm-hmm. that you were looking to fill oh yeah so any addict, we have a hole. And I just have to say, I believe, and anybody can disagree with me, that everybody has an ism. Everybody mm-hmm. uses to get out of, outside of themselves. You know, yeah. if whether it's going on your phone a lot, going on Instagram, DMing somebody, flirting with the bar. Like I would say, I, I would flirt with anybody, you know, or mm-hmm. eating a piece of cake. Or, you know, we all have something where we don't want to feel. Human yeah. beings don't want to feel you know, depression and loneliness, abandonment, fear of intimacy. And so that was that whole, like, I never felt good enough. I fear of intimacy, going to be abandoned. So Mm -hmm. this time in my life from 12 and on is I was overlapping partners. Like, like I said, I had long-term boyfriends, but they all kind of overlapped. Mm -hmm. And I had friend, male friends who I flirted with. And you know, acted like I liked them when I didn't. And what it all came down to was I was always chasing somebody to have power and control over. Mm -hmm. And it was my favorite thing to meet somebody, become the image they thought I was, like put on a mask. I would put on like, oh, this person wants me to be this for them, so I'll put that mask on. I'll act like that and I'll get them to love me or Mm -hmm. I have power and control over them. And the moment I did, and I hooked them, I would be bored. The game would be mm. over. I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that thrilling. It wouldn't be that dirty or like all those words I use. And then I would find myself just moving to the next person. And it was just kept doing that. And I, I always thought, I'm just not meeting the right guy. I'm not meeting the guy that fills all my needs. And I used to say, and I heard a friend say this recently. She said it too. And I was laughing at her. She said, I just want to like take two, three or four guys and kind of mold them together because <laughs> I get something from each of them. And I was, and I looked at her and I said, yeah, you can't do that. Like yeah. how you can't tell somebody they're not good enough when you want, want to mold them with somebody else. Like that's not fair to the other person, but that's what I was doing. Yeah. I was getting emotional support from one, getting sexual with the other, getting, you know, financial help or whatever it is. And it just, it just never ended. It just, and being an actress in Hollywood, it's like there sex and love addict is rampant in Mm. my community of, you know, actors and production people and crew. Like we have showmances where you go on set and you, you know, flirt with somebody or intrigue with somebody or even have an affair. And while you're shooting that movie for six months, four months or the show for a year, when you're done with the show or shooting, you know, the romance is over. It's called a mm-hmm. showman. So I talk a lot about that in Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. And I go into detail of all the ways how this, my career has, you know. But mm-hmm. here's the thing. The moment I knew something was wrong and I hit my bottom, I had the wherewithal to be like, I can't do this the rest of my life. Like, am Mm -hmm. I going to be on my deathbed, never completely connected to another soul? Am I going to be trying to get, you know, friends that aren't show up for me? Am I trying to get these people, unavailable people to love me? And then these other people, I play with their emotions. And it was just, it was a chaos of mess is what it was. (laughs) Oh, wow. Um, Well, something, well, two things that you mentioned there that were really interesting as well that were on my mind. You know, you mentioned how you thought you just can't meet the right guy. And was that the story that was going through your head for a long time? Possibly before maybe your bottom that you mentioned that that was something else I was curious to know about what was your breaking point. But up before that, you know, was that the story that was kind of going through your head? Like it it wasn't anything in you. You just couldn't find... Yeah. meet the right guy mm. yeah I just couldn't meet the right guy that fulfilled all my needs yeah. but here's the thing no one can fill all your yeah. needs because the the needs I needed filled and what I think a lot of people in this society especially with you know social media looking always looking for the next best thing the shiny object swipe left swipe right like we're all now overstimulated looking for mm-hmm. this like perfect partner 
And I just realized like, there's no such thing as a perfect partner. There's no such thing as a soulmate. No one can complete me. No one can give me everything I need. The only person that can do that is me and my God or higher power or universe, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that bottom moment that I hit, you know, 11 years ago is I was in a relationship that I really cared about. Like Mm. I cared about this person. I loved him as much as I could love him. Mm. We were living together and I thought that period of my life was over. Not that I wanted to get married to him. I never wanted to get married. I never wanted kids. I just didn't, I came from a broken family. Mm. You know, I never saw a healthy marriage. You know, I never saw my parents kiss or hold hands or even sleep in the same bed. So that wasn't what I envisioned, Mm. but here this guy was that I cared about and who I'd want to be friends with. That was a big thing. A lot of people I was with before, I didn't even like them as people. Like Mm. they were rude to waiters. They just weren't, there was things I was like, I don't like that about them. And this person, I was like, if we weren't together, I'd want to be his best friend. He's just a really good person. So the bottom happened when we were together after I think four years and a mentor of mine died. And I found myself two days later on location shooting a movie, you know, 2,000 miles away. And I met a, somebody I was working with and I started intriguing and flirting again. And I didn't know why I was doing it because, again, this was someone I didn't like. He was rude. He was rude to the crew. He was like a prima donna. And mm. that's not really my thing. So I remember sitting in my dark hotel room in the middle of nowhere and going, wow, it's not anybody else. This has to be me. Like Mm. here's someone I care about and I'm about to do it again. I'm about to blow up my life again. And I called a friend and she hooked me up with her therapist and I went back in LA and I went to the therapist as soon as appointment I could get. And I talk about this. Um, It's all in the book, but Mm -hmm. um, I have this moment and I, you know, say everything. She just meets me. And there's two things she said to me, and I'll tell you them both. And they're in the book, but here they are. Um, I'm not giving all the secrets away. I'm just giving little No, I'm sure there's still lots and lots in the book. It's a lot. It's 315 pages. It's a lot. Um, But she said, you wear the mask of one of my other clients who's a high class prostitute. And I was like, what is she talking? Like, I was so offended. I was like, I am like, proper Mm. I'm southern like I was like in my head being like I do not have a lot of partners I would never sell myself like this judgment came up and then the second thing she said to me is you're a sex and love addict and I looked at her and I was like what are you talking about that's not a real thing like that's a man thing I thought that too and she and I went through the 40 questions so if you're listening out there these 40 questions it's 40 self-diagnosed questionnaire on sex and love addicts anonymous just write 40 self-diagnosed questions s-l-a-a and they'll pop up Mm. but it was things like do you believe that sex and relationships will make your life bearable have you ever felt that you had to have sex do you believe that someone can fix you uh do you feel desperate or uneasy when you're away from your lover or sexual partner Uh, What's another good one that I love? Oh, do you get high from sex or romance? Mm. Or do you find yourself unable to stop seeing a specific person, even though seeing this person is destructive to you? So those are like some of the 40 questions. And after I answered them with her, the number I got was like, I could not deny that I had a problem. And you'll have to read the book to hear the number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah, I got in my car I on the 101 highway on in Hollywood in horrible traffic, and I was bawling my eyes out. And I called my boyfriend, and I was like, <gasps> she says I'm a sex and love addict. And I got home, and he proceeded to print out all the meetings in Los Angeles, which Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous is huge in L.A., and highlighted mm-hmm. all the meetings I could go to. And I found myself in a meeting that night at 730 in a horrible fluorescent lit church basement, just 40 people in a plastic, terrible chairs, you know, every walk of life, like I said, and I listened to the speaker and 
every single person in there said something I could identify with. And I started crying in the meeting, which just, if you knew me, I don't cry in in public. I'm a pretty private person. Mm -hmm. And I cried though, because for the first time in my life, I did not feel so broken or alone. Mm -hmm. Like I just didn't have the tools to have a healthy relationship. I didn't get those tools. Yeah. Wow. Um, (laughs) That moment I could imagine, well, can't imagine but that yeah that sense of relief you know we we all have that sense of belonging in one sense or another but again it's where do we find that and I love you know so much of what you shared though as well and I agree with you as well that I think I think in I think all of us nearly nowadays are an addict of some form you know we because again we're so taught to be on whether it's food whether it's social media whether it's binge watching tv whether it's over exercising you know sex drugs alcohol there's an array of things out there online shopping we all have that sense of you know something lacking or this this is the thing that's you know really going to make me feel so fulfilled and happy and you know the masks and the changing like you mentioned as well but it's like the dopamine hit every time we need more and more mm-hmm. and more to get the same hit until it ultimately comes you know we we wake up for want of a better word we come to the realization that like you mentioned as well it was like you saw that it was you mm-hmm. maybe that needed to change and you know it does all start from within and again it's been mentioned so many times in different conversations that self-responsibility we mm-hmm. are the only ones who can give all these things to ourselves. And that's not to diminish anyone on the external. Absolutely, they can fulfill it, but it all has to start from within. We have to have that connection. And I truly believe as well, it is a spiritual connection that we're all missing, that connection to our truth or higher self, source, God, whatever you want to call it. And then living from that place is more whole and you know you're bringing the best of you to every situation then as well so that's really powerful but just wanted to touch on as well you know within Hollywood like you mentioned like you mentioned it's rampant Mm -hmm. how then as well I imagine there's a lot of shame as well that comes with this cycle like any cycle you know that that kind of guilt and shame pattern was that something that was true for you as well well I mean I did have the shame I think I'm so far from it now I definitely like I said I never wanted to tell anybody it's not like I went on set or around the world going I'm a sex and love addict you know like it wasn't something I discussed but it's just like the doing all that work looking at your character defects taking you know, responsibility for the people you have wronged, being of service to other people, you know, really looking at yourself. And something you also just said, I want to mention, so I don't forget, but like, I don't believe anybody can ever fill us like Mm. they can try, but it's real. They're never going to be able to like, nobody is ever going to be able to give me exactly what I need because I have to do it. And that's yeah. the thing that I think this program, it's about, it says sex and love in it, you know, addicted to sex and love, but really, really what you get from this program is self love. Mm-hmm. Like I love myself so much that I have no shame. I have no secrets. I don't have anything hidden anymore in the dark corners of my mind. I've developed my own self-love. I have my own self-worth and dignity. I have boundaries Mm -hmm. with people. Nobody in my life, including friends, including family members, you know, don't show up for me. And those are the things I got to learn. I got to learn healthy boundaries and behaviors and healthy relationships because I started it with myself. Mm, I just stripped everything away you strip everything away you know I didn't have sex for a year in my program with my boyfriend you know I had cried nine months of horrible withdrawal Mm -hmm. and this one addict came in at six months into my withdrawal and he was a heroin a recovering heroin addict and he said I can quit heroin but I can't quit her Mm -hmm. and I never saw him again after that and it was like this is no joke. So I really allowed myself to go through the withdrawal, to do the work. To It took me nine years to get through my 12 steps. And other people, listen, it, they go through them quicker. I do not suggest that for anyone. That's yeah. just what it took for me. For you, yeah. Yeah, for me. But it's just like, doing that work and being in Hollywood and going on set and, you know, attractive people, people, you know, everybody's so 
charismatic. So it was really hard at first for me. You know, I didn't, I, one of my bottom lines for me, and that's like how you count sobriety. One of my bottom lines obviously is no cheating outside my relationship. The second one that was really big was no texting, emailing, or talking to any guy at all. And that includes Mm -hmm. like, I'd be at a restaurant and a waiter would ask what my order is. And I would find myself, I couldn't even make eye contact with the waiter because I would be flirting when I didn't mean Mm -hmm. to. So I just look down at my menu and tell them what I want and never make eye contact. So working on set with, you know, other people having sexual scenes, that was really hard at first. So honestly, the first year of my recovery, I didn't work as an actor. I didn't even actually think I was going to go back to the business. I was willing to let go of my relationship with my boyfriend, to let go of my career because I was in so much pain and I needed to change or I was going to die like Mm, that. I didn't want to be 70, 80 and be like searching for this outside thing that could never fulfill me. Yeah, wow. And that's commendable that you stuck it out. And that popped into my head before you mentioned it as like, wow, to stay in the industry as well was really just a true testament to your own healing as well and where you've come to. Well, it wasn't me. It was God. Yeah. It was my God. Because I literally prayed to God. I said, listen, if I'm not meant to do this career anymore, then you take it away, God. You take it away. And he didn't. I mean, he took it away for a short, you know, a year, but Mm -hmm. he brought me, you know, gave me jobs. He, you know, everything is because God, it's in God's time and it's not about me. So I just now show up for my life and I, you know, give the day over to God or my universe. And I say, you know, you, you use me where you need me to be. Mm, love that. Um, So many questions I still want to ask, (laughs) but we're, we're getting there. But curious to also know when you came to the acceptance and went to your first meeting and everything as well what was the reception from society like or what is it as a recovering addict in society oh it's amazing yeah I I love being a recovering addict in society because it feels like I have this superpower now where before I just felt like I was like a reactionary to everything happening to me and being the victim and like someone like gets mad at me now I can rap I can really look at it and be like oh no like something's going on with them and I I can read mm-hmm. people better and sure society looks as addicts as you know damaged messed up and honestly I mean I some of the best, actually the best people in my life are recovering addicts because we really dig in and do the work and take accountability. And when somebody's willing to take accountability and say, listen, I have done some shitty things, but I'm not a shitty person. And there's yeah. something so glorious about those people. They're my favorite people. People in recovery are my favorite. Like I could talk to people in recovery for hours and hours and hours. But yeah, society is really hard on addicts and it's really hard on sex and love addicts. It's not a talked about disease. Mm. There are, I think it's 6% in the United States are sex and love addicts and 38% of those are women. And Mm. that was a statistic from 15 years ago. So I'm telling you now, you go to a meeting on Zoom and it's hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world, like all over the world and younger and younger, 19, 20 year olds coming in. And if you're listening and you're 18 or younger, you cannot come into a meeting. I just have to say that. Mm -hmm. There's another program for you. But um, I just, I'm so grateful to be on the other side of this disease because it was killing me. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say that, you know, I'm now married. Like I said, I never want to be married. I have a son. I have an almost three-year-old toddler. I never wanted a son. And guess what? I'm still with the same man I was that highlighted those meetings. Oh, wow. We've been together 16 years. It's not like I got recovery in this program and Mm. found the perfect partner because there is no perfect partner. Yeah, but that's incredible. He is my partner for life and I love him and I respect him and we have communication and we talk about God and we talk and we make amends for when we've done wrong. But here's the thing. If he leaves me tomorrow, I will be devastated. I, he, it won't kill me. Yeah. I will be okay. I can take care of myself. I can pay for myself. I, I can feel my feelings and move on. Like if my husband left me today, I would be okay. And I Mm. could not say that 11 years ago. And because now I have this thing 
that I did for myself that I get to take to the grave. And here's the thing. You have to love yourself the most. We we are born with ourselves and we die with ourselves. Mm. Nobody else goes with us. And that is the best thing I've ever done for myself. Yeah. Wow. Epic. Um, that's brilliant that he was a light mm-hmm. for you and still continuing to be lights for each other, I'm sure, in your path. And that piece of realizing that, yeah, and I remember I had a realization during a really traumatic breakup where my ex literally just sent me an email and disappeared. But no. I, I had that moment of, oh shit, yeah, I can't control anyone or anything outside of me. And mm-hmm. yes, at the time I could say I was more codependent whereas now I'm like no I can totally be in relationship and like you're saying that if they decided to leave I'm like I'd be absolutely devastated and have to move through and process those emotions but also there's the acceptance of well that's okay too you know yeah. um it's that it is that responsibility you know of taking accountability and realizing that as well you know which for me gives another level to living realizing that anything could disappear in a moment you know so it helps you to just appreciate be present forget about the the stupid little bits and be honest and open and vulnerable and truthful I mean is there any other way to live (laughs) (laughs) well lots apparently until until you find your path to yourself (laughs) which is also fine but just really curious um what do you think since the numbers have exploded over the last while I'm sure for all ages as well of all types of addictions what do you think is one of the crooks to why that is happening especially in western society um well there's a number of things I think social media and and texting and those kind of ways to communicate people think they're connecting and being intimate but you're still very disconnected Mm -hmm. you know going online and talking to a camera and in stories or it's a mirror you're just looking at yourself so we have these things in our life now that we feel we're connecting and communicating and we're actually not Mm -hmm. so i think that's a big thing i think you know the filters the shiny gloss the wanting you know to be like a hollywood celebrity all those things are keeping us disconnected from our Mm -hmm. own reality and seeing the beauty of our everyday life and then I think that the last thing that is very much affecting society is the availability to porn, mm. you know, how rampant it's almost, it's become an epidemic for our younger generations. They said, I re- watched a whole thing on it on CNN and, you know, younger guys are coming into the program being porn addicts, having trouble with porn. And mm-hmm. they're saying that, that it desensitizing young men. Mm. So when they first yeah. have their first kiss or, you know, they like a girl that goes away because all they're thinking about is these images that aren't real, that are fantasy, mm-hmm. that are act out. And they think that's what sex and romance and stuff looks like. So they're saying right now, I mean, there's a huge thing about it that this next, this generation coming up, we're going to see some really bad depression, suicide attempts, lack of marriages, lack of commitment. And I'm seeing it already. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you from being in the room, speaking all over that this younger generation is dying, dying for connection and intimacy. They, they are looking outside themselves so much, but Mm -hmm. here's the other thing. They're aware of it at the same time, more Mm -hmm. than, you know, my generation or uh, ones older than me. So I'm really pulling for them. I feel like with everything going on that it's going to be very hard there's a lot of suicide right now I've seen Mm. a lot of friends die from this disease so I don't know I mean we're in for a wake-up call I think yeah well I agree and I I I believe that's partly why 2020 happened as well we are being all asked to wake up to come back to ourselves to check what we are doing to become self-aware to consciously you know make the connection of how our actions may impact not only ourselves but others and the planet and come back to that conscious connection of thinking oh hang on for a second what do I want to create for myself for others for the world for future generations and I think that is the question we're all being asked to look at or have or thoughts or 
patterns and you know what we're seeing in the world is a product of our creation it didn't just appear it is man-made it's from our mind our thoughts or creations Mm -hmm. so we have to be the ones to step up to change as well to see that effect in the physical 3d world as well and like that you know like you mentioned as well throughout the conversation it all starts within and it starts within in looking at our own habits our own thoughts the stories we tell ourselves and like you say taking off the masks it's time to take Mm -hmm. off the masks you know for all of us so super empowering and we we can only hope and keep doing our little piece and connecting Mm -hmm. to that truth within ourselves because that does ripple out as well and keep choosing the light and going for the light as opposed to getting caught in all the mayhem and being there as a support and guide for others or a mentor and that's epic and I know you've mentioned the 12-step program as well lots of times and what a support it has been to you but I'm also curious as a final question what else was really beneficial to you in your recovery or is there a tool or practice that you still use consistently that just really benefits you and supports you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I pray every day Mm -hmm. to something I don't always understand. I do a gratitude list every night. I list three things I'm grateful for. I filled up many books. Um, I... I'm a, I sponsor, you know, four women that are all over the world. I go to nine meetings a week now on Zoom. I'm mm-hmm. on a meeting every morning to start my day. Um, and the other thing I've, I've been doing that has helped me this last year through the pandemic is I started a podcast called Secret Life mm-hmm. where I give other people a platform, you know, anonymous. A lot of people are anonymous, also well-known um, people. We just had on Olivia Munn and Jana Kramer and other people and give a platform to share their secrets, to share their shame, addiction they've gotten through or addiction they're still in or suicide attempts or, you know, abortion stories, fertility issues they're shamed of, every single subject you can imagine. We've had 33 episodes and we have 89 still recorded. So Mm. yeah, I being of service that way, being of service outside of myself, writing the book, like Mm. I didn't realize how much growth I have had this last year, rewriting the book over and over and over and then publishing it. And then, you know, the first weekend it hit bestseller on Amazon, which I was like, huh? Like what? (laughs) This is like a little girl from the South that was dyslexic and had ADHD. And like, so I just know whenever I'm of service to other people are showing up for other people and being my transparent, vulnerable self is when it, it allows me to heal myself. So my whole tagline for the Secret Life podcast is tell me your secrets, I'll tell you mine. And so every episode I tried to reveal something about myself I don't want to reveal. Mm. So doing those things, talking to people like you just like connects me to another human to know that I'm not alone and we're mm. all in this together and we're all just trying to figure it out and do the best that we can. But it's our responsibility not to let our character flaws run us. Like I I name in the book, you know, all those character defects I talk about in chapter five and six and seven, those are mine, like all of them. So, you know, as long as I don't let those run my life, Mm. then I can show up for someone else. And that's, isn't that the whole purpose of living now? Yep, I agree. <laughs> and um, I love that. Don't let the, the character flaws run us because again, yeah, we're all human. We're all here to mess up and go through challenges and difficulties. But I think you're the epitome as well of what can happen when actually you face up to them. You get honest, you do the inner work, yeah. you connect back to yourself. And you wrote a bestseller book and you said you're dyslexic and everything. When we get out of our own way, our true path can show up and what we're here to actually and how we're here to be of service can come through so I love that message as well that you shared so please share as well where people can find out more about your work and your book and your podcast and as always I link them as well and all the show notes yeah so yeah if you want to reach me on Instagram it's at the Brianne Davis or you can do at Secret Life Novel for the book or Secret Life Podcast for the podcast then you can go to Secret lifenovel.com and all the articles and everything is linked to that if you want a signed copy of the book you can get it there and you know if you're struggling out there I just have to say reach out to me I'll send you to the right place you know you are not alone 
go DM me on Instagram or even TikTok. I just joined TikTok at the dot Brianne Davis. So yeah, we are not alone in this. If you're struggling, I am here right with you and I will be of service. So thank you for having me on. Amazing. No, thank you so much for joining and sharing and for the work that you're doing. Um, It's epic and keep going. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notified every time a new show is released. Get more information on this week's guest as well on my website www.soulpowerlight.com.